We think of researchers as pushing the frontiers of science forward and at a fast pace, so fast that information learned today is out of date within years and sometimes months or even weeks. So why would a renowned ecologist study the centuries-old work of Alexander von Humboldt? The director of the University of Wyoming's program in ecology, Steve Jackson, tells Wyoming Signature's Jeff Lockwood why he looks into the lives, times, and insights of 19th century naturalists. Steve, thanks for joining me this morning. The book is on a 200-year-old piece of scientific work by this fellow, Alexander von Humboldt. Now, I'm going to bet that not one in a thousand Americans, I'll bet not one in a hundred scientists could tell you one thing about Alexander von Humboldt. Why should any of us know or care about this guy? Why should an educated person know? Why should a scientist? If we went back 150, 160 years, Humboldt would have been a household word in the United States. <laughs> Uh, he was uh, the most influential scientist and scholar of the early 19th century and had uh, very large impacts on American culture. In fact, to understand 19th century American culture, uh, you really have to go back to look at a lot of uh, Humboldt's works. He hmm. was read uh, by and influenced people from Ralph Waldo Emerson to Walt Whitman to Henry David Thoreau to Edgar Allan Poe, who in fact dedicated his last book uh, to, uh, to von Humboldt. So he might be like the, the Carl Sagan or the E.O. Wilson of the early 1800s? Exactly, only even, even more so because okay. he, he uh, covered really every discipline uh, within the sciences and even some of the social sciences, politics, ethics, and, and so forth. Uh, if, if we were to have gone to, to go back to, say, 1860, uh, you would find in the library of any educated person, whether it's uh, uh, a lawyer in Boston, a, uh, a merchant in, uh, in Philadelphia, or a, um, an army captain at, uh, stationed at Fort Laramie, they would have uh, Humboldt's books well used and well read uh, wow. in their library. So we've just, uh, we've just forgotten the impact that he made on Western culture, European culture, American culture at that time. And has it, has it continued today or is his legacy sort of, uh, I mean, is it one of those things that we can still feel the, the vibrations of, of Alexander von Humboldt now 200 years later? Well, certainly scientifically, his, his vision of, uh, of a unified science of the earth that encompassed mm -hmm. the atmosphere, the earth's surface, the oceans, uh, the vegetation and uh, animals living on the surface and the human habitations and human uses of land. Uh, he had a vision in the early 19th century of a unified science that integrated all of those parts that was largely lost from view through the second half of the 19th century and really most of the 20th century. But it's something that we're coming back to. Um, largely with uh, concerns with, um, with human impacts at a global scale on the atmosphere, the oceans, the land surface. So we ought to know about this in terms of, of history, but I mean, let's face it, science is, is a super fast changing right, field of, of, of inquiry. I mean, you're at sort of the cutting edge of paleoclimatology and all of this well, stuff. I would, I would argue that, um, that science is cumulative and just uh, in the same way that it's impossible to understand contemporary American culture and politics without understanding the history of, uh, of American culture and politics. Um, you can't really understand science at any given point without understanding some of its history. It's cumulative. Isaac Newton said that uh, I, I've seen uh, more clearly only by standing on the shoulders of giants. And uh, it's important to understand the cumulative nature of science and to be able to look back, um, again, because science is an historical process, it is progressive. We are learning more about the world, but we make mistakes along the way. And in the history of science, there are numerous blind alleys that uh, we, we walk up. And right now, we don't know which of the, the frontiers of science are going to be blind alleys and which ones are, are going to be um, uh, uh, persistent in the future. So by going back uh, and looking at our roots, we can, we can both get a better understanding of the process of science, and we can also understand why we are where we are today and avoid making mistakes like ignoring the Earth as a complete system 
in Humboldt's vision as it uh, as we did for almost a, a full century. What happened? Where did it, where did it fall apart in the last in the last uh, two centuries? Why did we forget about this unification? I think a lot of it was just disciplinary fragmentation and specialization in the sciences, which in many ways was inevitable. Uh, it it, uh, it uh, scientific progress really required us to drill in intensively on different areas to have a, a very focused discipline of say vertebrate paleontology or um, meteorology or uh, or uh, surficial geology but uh, and and I think we we needed to be doing that to understand the details but in doing so we lost that bigger picture of how all these parts fit together and how processes on the land surface just the nature of the vegetation on the land surface could affect the dynamics of the atmosphere and in turn how the dynamics of the atmosphere could influence uh, ocean temperatures and circulation which in turn could feed back and affect the uh, amount of rainfall and snowfall we get in places like Laramie, Wyoming that are uh, a thousand or more miles from the nearest ocean. Thanks for coming in this morning. I appreciate mm -hmm. your time and uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Jackson is an expert in ancient climates and paleobiology.